left is Fern, to my right is Olivia and Quinn. Our mentor is Lauren Bukovic. She's in the psychology department within the area of cognitive neuroscience. So there are, what we're studying is the role of feedback, excuse me, the role of consolidation in, uh, the role of consolidation in learning and uh, categorization. Um, we're specifically looking at um, memory and uh, learning through memory. Um, there's many types of memory, but the two that we're focusing on are explicit and procedural. You also have different systems of learning, category learning, such as rule-based, which uses explicit memory, and procedure, which uses procedural memory. So in explicit um, memory, when rule-based learning is in the process, um, we use the prefrontal cortex, um, the area, a brain region that's necessary for attention and impulse and executive control. Um, when it's in the process, it is very easy to verbalize, but, um, sorry, <laughs> it's a, it is very easy to verbalize and um, we're very well aware of it. Obvious candidate would include formulating and testing our explicit rules. When you look, for example, when you look at these images, you can easily distinguish the difference between a cat and a dog and a square and a circle. Okay, and the other learning system that we have is the procedural learning system. And this takes place in the basal ganglia, so Generally, this area and the basal ganglia is made up of other little structures such as the cutting nucleus and the epidermis. And so, with procedural learning, they've generally been known generally been known as fine motor skills. So, like for fine motor skills, some examples are like a golf swing or a baseball swing. And since they're since they're like you know fine motor skills, they require tons of practice and tons of repetition in order to get them down consistently. So a big distinguishing factor between the two categories is that um, the procedural learning is they're hard to verbalize. So while it's easy to say the rules to identify a square and like it has four corners, it's not so easy to um, say the rules like a perfect golf swing. So if we if we were trying to explain to someone you know how to hit the perfect drive or something, we we'd, we'd realize it's it's not so easy. So I mean one example that we can all relate to is driving. So it's a motor skill that we probably do every day, but if someone were to ask us, like, okay, like, what are the rules for driving? Like, what are the steps? It'd be hard for us to remember every little detail from getting into the car, like turning on the ignition, putting it in drive, and all the other steps in between. So with the procedural learning system, what I'm trying to get at is that there's these things that we can learn that are like, highly complex, and we can do them without really thinking about it. So a skill that we can learn through this system is a categorization skill. And we're able to categorize highly complex things rather than just a square and a circle. And we, we can categorize them, but we won't be able to explain it. So Olivia will talk about some real world examples. So here's a picture of a mammogram. Um, something that radiologists look at on a daily basis. To us, it's just like a regular picture that we have no idea what it is. Um, but with years of training and repetition and experience, they are able to categorize it as a tumor or a non-tumor. Um, in this case, there is actually a tumor there. Now we're testing procedural learning, procedural memory. Our stimuli on each trial um, looks something like this. There are many, as you'll see in the next slide, many different um, line thicknesses, tilt, but all these stimuli were placed in a MATLAB program, programmed into different categories, category A or category B. At that time, we brought in our subjects. When our subjects came in, they sat at the computer and they themselves, without knowing the already um, programmed categories, they were told to choose which category they think each subject would, each stimuli would go into, if they thought it would go into category A or category B. At the end of each trial, the subject was given feedback. They were told if the category they chose was correct or incorrect, and they do that for 600 trials. So for rule-based category learning, when it's being experimented on our human test subject, 
In this case, the orientation does not matter, but the bar width does, because that's how you categorize the two different categories in this situation. So um, for category A, you could tell that um, the bar width is thin, but category B, the bar width is thick. As I said before, the rule-based lining category is much easier to explain than procedural. Okay, this is a procedural memory task. So this is more like a task that we gave our subjects. So like Quinn just said, um, in the other task, they could easily say the rule for category A. So you know, once the bar width got a certain width, it was category B. So here, um, they, they couldn't easily explain the rule. So the rule here was actually that once the orientation is greater than the bar width, then the stimuli would fall in category A. If the bar width was greater than the orientation, they'd fall into category B. So what we found out was that their task, the subjects would actually start getting these a lot, like they would get them correct more consistently. But once they walked out, they say that, yeah, like by the end I got it, but I can't explain why. So, and then there was different conditions that we did with this task, and we'll talk about that. So with um, our experiment, we were testing to see if the different times that they took a break would help consolidate or not cons consolidate their memory. Um, so our first trial, like Joshua said, they did sit down and take 600 trials of that stimuli, um, and they got feedback, which is yet uh, correct or incorrect. And the first condition took an hour break. They came back and did 200 trials, but this time without feedback. The first time they were doing it, they were learning. The second time, we were just testing to see if they remembered what they learned in the first 600. The second condition was the same thing, except they took a three or more hour break. And then when they came back, we wanted to see if that consolidation, if that was enough time to consolidate the memory to remember what they learned in the first half. This graph shows the accuracy of our subjects uh, by condition. As you can see, the blue represents condition one, which had the test subjects who had the one hour break. The green line represents condition two, which represents the, the test group that had the three hour break. The importance of this graph is that it shows both session one and session two. Um, the, um, the line that you see going through the dotted line represents the break that they each had. Below, each, each unit represents 50 trials per block. And at the end of this, when you look at it, the most important thing to take away is that it shows that at the beginning, both conditions started off fairly well, and at the end, they ended fairly well with similar accuracy. Okay, so on our, on our graph, there was three main areas that we wanted to focus on. So there were blocks 12, block 13, and block 14. So like Joshua said, um, in block 12, we noticed that at the end of the first session, both groups ended right around the same accuracy, which was right around 82%, even despite the fact that the way they got there was obviously different, but they ended pretty much at the exact same spot. And then in block 13, this is right when they came back from their break. So as soon as they continued the task, we wanted to see if they improved or if they declined. So what we found was that the one hour group, once they came back, they immediately started increasing their accuracy. But the three hour group, when they, come, when they came back, they actually just pretty much stayed at the exact same percentage accuracy. And then we look at block 14. So this was once they, were, they kept going after the break. So even though the one, hour, the one hour group increased right after the break, once they kept going, they kind of just flatlined. And then the three hour group, they started off slow once they came back, but then they just spiked up a whole six percentage. And then you can look at blocks 15 and 16, and we see that they both declined, but that's pretty much because after so long with, without feedback, they're, they're bound to just forget everything. So in conclusion, the one hour group um, might, came, might have came back with better results, but after a few blocks, um, their, their performance starts to decline because um, their residual memory starts to uh, wear off. On the other hand, the three hour group seems, might have seemed to come back producing the same results, but after one or two blocks, their results start to increase because their procedural memory starts to kick in. Although um, we might have some interesting trends in our data, due to the small amount of um,
sample and test subjects, we were not too able to produce any significant amount of data because during the summer, no one's around. <laughs> um, so in the future, to be able to produce any significant amount of data, we would need a larger sample size to contribute to the research. And in the end, we want to thank everybody, because this was such an amazing time. Um, our mentor, Lauren, and the people that we met in her lab, and uh, Dean and Wendy for really helping us, and Mr. Yance for really going in and um, giving us feedback. And the cool thing, our little beach picture and um, being able to look at a rain was actually very, very interesting and very cool to see what we, what we actually look like. <laughs> so thank you.